Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, first of all. It's, I'm happy to be here talking to all of you and uh, telling you about something I've done and this is in, in chats with Matteo and with a lot of people in their group. So I, I come from computer science and I think a lot about how things are implemented. And, and this is sort of what we're going to be talking about. Uh, so to put this into context, people are doing all sorts of cool and interesting things with lenses and optics, using them to do magnificent stuff. Uh, this is looking at them from outside and doing something with them. Today we're going to open up the hood and sort of look internally how these things look. And so, like, if I have to give somebody a, a practical reason why this is why this is being done, it's you, I can say, well, it's important for actual implementation in software because it's going to turn out that lenses and optics actually give you different kinds of trade-offs when you implement them. But that's not the real reason I'm interested in this. Uh, the real re reason is more philosophical. Uh, and it's something I'm not sure how to explain. And I think maybe throughout the talk, it's going to come out. Uh, but in concerns how we think about these things, really. Uh, how we think about these things when we manipulate them inside our heads, when we, when we use them, and sort of establishing what is more, what kind of uh, constructions are more uh, more relevant in, in each case. Uh, so I assume not everybody knows what these lenses and optics are, but the, the rough idea is of the, the talk summary in, 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 two, in a minute is that when we're in, in a Cartesian setting, these lenses and optics are going to be isomorphic as categories. And, but this isomorphism is going to be blind to a lot of interesting aspects. So the idea will be to sort of see this isomorphism as a shadow of something more nuanced that gives us all this information. And that's what we're going to be talking about here. Um, also, I have a bit of a cold, so that's why I'm, uh, you will, uh, I'm at, the, at, the, at the tail end of this. Um, so, and of course, this, so I'm going to be talking about this. This is all related to as well as poly and all, all this interesting stuff. But I'm not going to be talking about the dependent case today. Uh, so really, I'll just start, and, and we can see how we get on. Uh, I don't really have a super thought-out plan, so we're just going to go and see where, where this goes. Um, all right, lenses. Yeah. Uh, they're defined in a category. By the way, so I'm going to fix a Cartesian category C for, for, this, uh, for this talk, and just, just have that as a, as a thing. And in this category, we can define lenses. So a lens is this kind of a gadget, which we think of has a forward part, and and has a backward part. And I assume many people are familiar, familiar with lenses. I assume many people might not be. I hope this sort of under the hood aspect might help understand that. So a lens consists of, of, of two maps really called get, uh, which sort of is the forward part. We can think of this as a neural network layer that produces computations forward or an agent is doing something or a, view, a, a database. You know, we have a database, we extract a row and a map put, which takes that thing, takes an updated uh, B, I'm calling it here B prime, and produces an updated A prime. Again, this could be gradients flowing backwards. This could be uh, utilities passed by in game theory. This could be updates to our database, and so on. And uh, we think of a lens like this. So what happens really is what I said. We have a forward pass. We do something. We save some state. And then we use it on the backward pass. Um, so I told you that this is a category, which means that if I have another lens like this, um, uh, uh, oops, yeah, this should be B, B prime, C, C prime. And I'm going to call this G2 and get to and put to. I'll just actually look at my notes for a second before I say anything else. Um, and you might want to think about how would you compose these lenses while I do this. It's a trick question. Um, um, right, so I'll, I'll, before, I, before I say anything more, I'm just going to say that a lens has this thing, right, called the internal state. It's sort of this wire here. Uh, we, and it's all, always of type A. It doesn't really seem like a thing we even want to make explicit data. 
and here it, it's going to always be equal to b. Um, so I might ask you, how, we, how do we hook up these lenses? How do we compose them? And category theory is all nice and great, so you might say, well, yes, we just do this, and we do this, and we have a composite lens. Right? Wrong. This is not a lens. Uh, maybe it's a surprise, maybe it's not. Uh, but the problem re really arises if you try to write um, the, the get and put maps of this composite. Um, um, uh, which, which really can't be done. So, but how do you see this like intuitively? Well, I've told you a lens has this shape, right? It has a get and a put and this internal state. But here we see we have two, we don't have an internal state of type. So our composite lens that we need to write, it would be from A, A prime to C, C prime. And it would need to be like this, having internal state A. But we see here that we have a tensor of internal state. So we already see that something is a bit fishy. And it's not really clear what happens here. Um, because I would love this to be like visual and to be cool, and it's not with lenses. So, but you can define composition in a different way. Um, so I'm going to do this step by step. Um, and if you think about the composite lens here, we would need to write the get map, uh, which goes from A to C. By the way, feel free to interrupt me at any point with any questions just so I don't lose you. Uh, um, but I'm trying to motivate sort of what happens here, like uh, when we think about them. Um, right. So we have two lenses trying to compose them. What is their composite? Well, we need to write a composite get map, which is pretty easy. We need a map going from A to C, right? And we do that by writing get one and by writing get two here. And now to write a composite put, uh, this, this is going to take an A, a C prime, and we need to produce an A prime, right? Uh, and how do we do this? I'm going to put in more space because I know what's about to come. Um, maybe even more space, actually. It's sort of we work backwards. Um, um, so the only way we can produce, so like, let's think about this. We need to produce an A prime using this data, right? Get one, put one, get two, put two. Well, the only way we can produce an A prime is using put one. So that must be it here, put one. So we have A times B prime. Okay, now we've reduced the problem. Now we need to produce an A, which we have, so that's good, but we need to produce a B prime. How do we do that? Well, the only way to do that is using put two. Uh, so we can write here a times put two. And here we're going to have a times b times c prime. Ah, OK. So now we need to produce a c prime, which we have. And we need to produce a b. How do we do that? Well, we see here, right? We need to produce a b. We, the only way we can do that is to use get one. Uh, so here I'm going to write uh, uh, in this notation where this is a copy. So we're going to have A get 1 times C prime. And this is going to be um, this, is, this is how this is the product, uh, sorry, pairing of two maps where this is identity. OK, so why, I'm to why am I talking about all of this? Uh, because we notice that the way these lenses are comp composed here is different than this. So how do we actually, like, how is it different? How do we draw this? So uh, the way we can draw this is as follows. Well, we, we know we need to get something of this shape. This is going to be our big lens. This is a very big forward map. And then we're going to have a very big backward map. This is the shape of a lens. So what happens here is we're, uh, the forward part just composes two get maps, as expected. So this is get one, get two. Now, oh god, there's lots of stuff happening here, but I'll simplify it. What really happens is that we have put, uh, sorry, let me do this. We have put one, which is here. The only thing that we need to use to produce A prime, C, C prime. And 
here we have put two. And then what we do here is this pairing copies our A and uses it here. And then we use get one as an input to put two here. So anyway, this looks very complex, but I'll explain what this means really. Um, does this make sense so far? Is there anything uh, right? So I've gone through like a very arduous job of unpacking what this is. And just to see that now, if you look at this composite lens, this is different than what we had here. And this thing actually, so it does something funny. It, it does the forward pass, and then it saves that intermediate state A. And then what does it do? Well, it recomputes. It copies that A again, and then it recomputes G1 uh, because it needs it as a P2. So sort of with the hindsight that we're thinking about implementation and how, like their internal structure, this might be ringing some alarm bells because why would we, if this is a neural network layer, we don't want to use lenses. That we don't want to recompute the whole thing again just to have the backward pass. So this looks a bit odd. Um, right. And um, we could even up the stakes and consider implementations of three or four lenses. And what we would see is that we would get like, not an exponential, but a very, uh, I think it ends up being more than linear, like grow of growth. No, it's actually quadratic, sorry. A growth of these get maps here, the more lenses we have, which really seems to exacerbate the problem. So as again, as somebody who comes thinking about implementation, this rings alarm bells to me. And it's like, why would I want to use that? Now, it turns out uh, this is not necessarily bad. It's a part of a trade-off. So what, what lens composition, so I'm sort of, sort of sharing now this aspect of lenses is that lenses perform a kind of computation that's, uh, that uses minimal memory, and we're gonna see this because we don't save any intermediate results like, like we might have guessed, but instead we just save the starting point and then recompute everything from that. Meaning we, we're going with lenses, so I'm gonna write it here. Uh, we're going to have uh, less memory in, in some abstract sense, right? But, but this really means in a tangible way once we implement it. Here it's all, all, all uh, more than so it's going to be less memory. It's going to be more time. Um, um, so this is a part of a trade-off. And by the way, uh, so this is known in the deep learning community. This is, has a name, actually. This particular way of com composing, this is called gradient checkpointing. People do this when they have a huge neural network and they don't know what to, like you can't store all the activations in the memory and you want to run it on your computer that, ha that has a very small memory. So you use this. It's called gradient checkpointing. And that's one of the surprising things I learned that lens composition embodies gradient checkpointing. This, this uh, memory uh, uh, constrained way of, of computing stuff. So this was pretty neat to me. Uh, and again, now this presents a co question. Okay, if this is lens composition, what is this? Uh, and I mentioned something about internal states and memory. So how, how does all of this work? Um, and this is where optics come. So I'm gonna share what optics are, how they're defined, and sort of show these relationships which, which uh, well, something interesting is gonna come out. But maybe, I'll, is there any questions so far? Just to get a, all right. What do you mean by, maybe you'll just get to this naturally, but what do you mean by what is this for the top picture? Because as I read the two pictures, they're the same after some rewriting and some simple way just from the kind of reason. Like, so if I do a drawing, I'm assuming that I'm not quite seeing uh, What's the last, last sentence you just said? If I'm drawing it? You're, you're contrasting the two pictures. Yeah. Sort of, some, the, 
equivalent up to yeah yeah and this and this rewrite right and this is yeah yeah and this rewrite actually carries important operational data Ah, yeah, yeah. It lives in the two cells, which we're going to see. Uh, so I didn't even, so let, let, me, let okay. me get, yeah. I'll, I'll be patient. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. So this was a category of lenses defined on a category C, and it works bidirectionally. Now we're going to define the category of optics, uh, optics on the same Cartesian category C. Uh, so by the way, both lenses and optics have objects sort of pairs. Uh, a and A prime, pairs of objects in the following category. So it's going to be the same here. Um, so these are like two categories people have defined to talk about this thing. And optics look like this. So optics are going to have the same objects, as I said. And then the home space here between two optics is given by this very scary formula involving a co-end. Uh, so how does it look? We're going to have a map from A into, I'm going to call this memory, uh, and since memory times B, and I'm going to have, say that memory, B prime into A prime. And this is a Cohen, so this means M. Now this, what this Cohen really means and wh what, it's, what its universal property is, it takes a while to unpack, is the following. If lens has this shape, uh, then an optic has, the fo has this shape. And uh, so this is going to be A. It's the same stuff. I've drawn this now a million times. Uh, with the so, uh, sorry, let me just say this. An optic here is going to be, uh, consist of three things. It's going to consist of an object M, which is in C. It's going to consist of a forward map, which goes from A to m times b, and a backward map which goes from m times b prime to a prime. Yeah, so this is a, an equivalence class of these, quotient by, out by something, um, uh, which I'm going to skip for now. Um, and this is going to be actually relevant. Well, we're going to see. So this is our forward map. This is how I think about it. And this is formal, uh, actually give a formal justification to these diagrams because there is a string diagrams for optic and Tambara theory and blah, blah, blah. But we're just now going to think about it like this. The idea is we have, so if we, if, we, if, if we looked at lenses and we were like, OK, so but you know, why is lens composition the way it is? Well, the problem is, right, why, why do we reuse all of this data? Well, the problem is that everything that we can save is, since the internal state is always equal to A, we can't save anything else, no matter how many lenses we compose. If there was a million lenses, we would still have to save A and then recompute everything on the backward pass. In optics, we say, OK, this is a freedom we have now to choose this internal state to our liking. So this is an optic consists of three, these three things. We choose an M, and then we can choose the forward pass, which uses that M, and a backward pass, which uses that M. So this is a dependent type. You can write it as a sigma, or well, it's a, it's a coin. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, this is a thing people defined, uh, and people use this all over. And you can compose optics in, in a very straightforward way, which uh, you actually seen already. So if I have another optic here, uh, this is going to, if this is f1 and b1, this is going to be f2 and b2. Uh, this is going to be residual n. So note that every optic chooses its own residual. And now when I compose them, I simply think of it I hope this is formal enough. I, I drew a big box around this. This is my forward pass. My residual is going to be m times n. There's a pair of them. So the more optics I compose, the bigger my memory is. And then the backward pass is going to be this box top. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. So right, and now, now what you can find in, in the literature is that people say when that uh, the category uh, of lenses is isomorphic to the category of optics. So, um, 
And you can show this to hold. Um, so we can see the categories have the same objects. And sort of to go from a lens to an optic, well, what do we do, right? We say, well, let's say we have this lens. And we need to get an optic, right? Well, we need to choose an M. What M do we choose? Well, M is our internal state, the thing we save. And we said that this is always equal to A. So to get a lens here, we would get, we would put A. And then the forward map we need to choose would be, well, what do we do here, right? This is our forward map. We just copy the input and use the other one for get. So our forward map would be A to I'm going to write copy A times A, and I'm going to write A times get one. So this would be A times B. And then the backward map needs to be something of type A times B prime two, right? This is going to be put. Um, <laughs> And we can actually see that when we go the other way, I don't know if I can, I can unpack how, given an optic, you can also get back a lens. Um, so yeah, uh, just to finish this analogy. So this is going to be more memory. Uh, less time. So by the way, I just, uh, I just want to say here, like, when I say here memory and time, right, this is still a crude concept when it comes to categorically, like, what, is, what does memory mean here? And it certainly deserves a, a level of more thorough formalization. But I think for now, it, it, there is some aspects that we can notice that are different um, and that we'd like to keep track of. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say that I feel like optics are not necessarily more memory. Because if you know A is a tuple type and your get map is a projection onto like the first element of the tuple, and then your memory is the second element of the tuple, then you're actually storing less for like updating the tuple. Yeah. yeah. So th that's a good point. I, I think I have to be a bit more precise here. I, I, what I mean here is as you compose these things, it is definitely the case that you're going to, in the Cartesian case, keep taking products. Uh, but you're absolutely right that you could come up with an optic that's sort of, in, yeah. So yeah, um, so what I want to see is basically, so yeah, uh, just to say one more thing, uh, David pointed out that this isn't really an optic. Uh, there is some sort of equivalence class here. So we don't really see uh, an optic here. Uh, like optics are, are uh, equivalence classes and they're quotiented out by a particular uh, particular way. And, and what, what does this way tell us? So it really tells us the following, and this is going to be where we're going to go now, uh, just to set the stage. Let's be prime to A prime. So this was our map F. Let's call this F1, and let's call this backward one. And let's say we had another optic, which was from A to n times b, and let's say we had another optic here, which was from n, this is, so this is the forward part of that optic, f2, and this is going to be b2. We're going to say that optics m, f1, b1, and n, f2, b2 are equivalent if there is a reparameterization from the corresponding residuals, m to n, uh, such that the following diagrams commute. So this is an R reparametrization, and there's a reparametrization here. 
uh, what's that, what that's going to end up meaning is that um, uh, is the following. Essentially, it's going to tell us that if you have a map R that's in between the optics, we don't care whether we consider this to be the backward pass and this to be the forward one, or we consider R to be part of the forward pass and uh, just consider this to be the backward one. And, and what the idea behind this is, this is really pretty really interesting. This tells us that we're looking from, at optics from the outside. So anytime we have an optic using this definition, we are actually treating it as a black box whose internals we don't know. So I've, I've told you an optic involves a residual, but this equivalence is gonna erase all the information we have about that internal. It's like it's going to tell us, okay, you know, maybe you have an optic that has this residual, but if from the outside it looks like this optic with that residual, you cannot distinguish between them. Um, and that's, that's uh, so yeah, I, find that, I found that pretty cool, uh, pretty interesting. Um, so now, what, what the whole point of this idea and the talk is, that we can make this stuff precise. We can see, this, we can see these operational differences. We can turn this isomorphism into an adjunction. Like we can, into a, uh, we can turn optics into a two category instead of a category. Uh, and, all, and have all these operational details become actually explicit data. Now, like, this depends about, like, it depends what you're interested in. I suppose many people in math mathematics are thinking about really denotational semantics, and if it computes an answer, it computes it. I found this really interesting that, you know, sometimes people say, oh, well, see, category theory doesn't work, because when I do this in deep learning, you actually don't see all of this stuff. And, Sometimes they might say, well, yeah, you need less category theory. And here I say, no, you need two category theory to actually see all of this stuff. So, um, so yeah, I feel like I'm actually not motivating this properly. I, I don't know how this sounds as, as, a, as, a, as an idea. But yeah, this is what I said about the philosophical aspect. First of all, I f this is uh, something that's tangibly uh, used that you can actually, and I'm gonna elaborate what this means for implementation, but, but, but somehow I think about lenses and optics differently. Like when I compose them, when I think about them, the fact that I have explicit, the fact that lenses are optics with one choice removed sort of tells me that in all this stuff with dependent lenses and with poly and, and all that stuff, we, we would like some extra levels of freedom that we can manipulate how, how these work. Uh, because if you use naively lenses for implementation inside neural networks, they might not do what you want. Uh, so yeah, how does this work? Uh, uh, the main idea of this talk, really, of, 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 of the category theory behind this, is that optics, uh, a, a natural definition for optics, is not as a category, but as a two category. So. What I'm going to write now, I'm going to do very few symbol changes. I'm going to write two optic, and I'm going to draw a square here. Uh, now, this is a very magical thing. Uh, and I'm going to, instead of writing isomorphism, I'm going to, uh, so by the way, this was an isomorphism in CAT, right? Where uh, we had a functor from lenses to optics and a functor from optics to lenses. Now, we're going to have two optic and maps going this way uh, uh, and uh, we're going to have an inclusion and a projection and they're going to be adjoint in this way. Uh, so what does that mean? Um, what I've done now actually is, I have to actually elaborate a lot of things. So the idea is to turn Anytime I see a quotient, I find it a bit funny, like uh, I want to make it explicit data. In terms of we can do that, instead of having a, 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 a coent here, which is a universal object, we can, we can look inside of it and we can have all these quotients, all these reparametrization become explicit categorical data that we can think about. So this is really not partic particularly relevant to optics, just to say, this is a general fact. 
that any uh, co-limits uh, are sort of shadows of, of, of their higher categorical counterparts. So this was very cool for me to learn. Uh, so what I've drawn here is something called, uh, this is the notation I've got from Fosco's book. Uh, this is an Oplax coent, and uh, there's a square used for this. <coughs> uh, how do you think about this? It sounds very scary and the math looks wow, but the idea is the same. Uh, we have optics, but now we don't have an equivalence class anymore. We actually have a, an optic is literally a map F forward and backward. There's no quotient. And if we have another optic, so this is one, and if we have another one, we say a two cell between them is given by a reparametrization such that these diagrams are satisfied. Um, so this gives us a two category of optics. Right. Um, so what does this now mean? So there's, there's like a, f I'm trying to find the, the, the shortest uh, way to, to, to say some interesting stuff that comes out. So we have a two category here now, which is the two category of optics. And here we have just the old, plain old category of lenses because there's no residuals. There's no data that we can manipulate and therefore no two cells. Now, previously, we've had the following thing hold. Uh, we've had the following thing hold. So if we had a home set of lenses and a home set of just plain optics, not two optics, uh, since we showed that there was an isomorphism of categories, this means that there were functions going forward and backward. Uh, the first of which takes a lens and gives us an optic. And I call this, it reifies the residual. It makes it concrete. So instead of thinking of lenses as this forward and backward part without A, here we turn that into an explicit data. And then we had the residual eraser, which would erase it back. Um, and I actually didn't tell you what this was, but uh, I, don't know, I don't know if you see it or maybe, maybe I should. Uh, but I think I'll just go for now. That you can erase the residual of an, of a, of a, of an optic. And, and these were, since this was an isomorphism of categories, this was a, a, an isomorphism as well of sets. But what happens now is something really cool and very surprising is that now since this is, since optic is a two category, this means this thing here, two optic, is going to be a category. So we're going to have a function from a home set here, thought of as a discrete category, into optics. A home set of optics, which is now a category. So this is going to be a full-blown functor. Uh, <coughs> And same going backwards, this is going to be a functor from this home category into lenses. So, so let me give you an idea. If we start with a lens and turn it into our, an optic, we get something of this shape, right? The forward part is this, the backward part is this, this is A. Now, if we turn that back into a lens, well, there's only one thing we could get, really. We're going to get back G1, since the, the residual has to be always A. There's no residual, we're going to get P1. So going round trip is the same stuff. But note that going the other way isn't. So if we start with an optic which has an arbitrary complex residual, uh, so let's say we go, we start from M, F1, B1, and let's think about what happens when we turn it into a lens. Well, we need a map get and put. Our get map is going to be F1 uh, composed with projection in B. Um, so if we start with this, we're going to project B as our forward map. And our backward map is going to be, sorry, this is B1. Uh, <coughs> we need something that goes from A times uh, B prime to A prime. So how do we do that? Well, we're going to do F1 
projection pi uh, a, uh, sorry, pi, pi uh, m, so this goes from a to m, and then we tensor it with b prime, and uh, compose it with b1. And now you can see that if you go backwards, uh, so this is, it, it seems like maybe very, very notationally verbose, uh, but now if you want to turn that back into an, into an optic, note that any lens is going to have the residual A here, which is already different than the rem, and there's going to be something here and something here. So when we go round trip, we don't get an isomorphism, we get sort of a two cell going in one of the directions. And it's going to turn out that residual reification is left adjoint to erasure. Um, right. Sorry? Right. It goes the other way, I think. Uh, so, it's okay. what so makes you. You said, one or, you said one or the other way. I think it depends on how you define the two cells. Uh, it, yeah. Uh, maybe I drew it here. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Okay, so given what I've told you so far, there should maybe your your suspicions should be arising that this is correct. At least mine were. Uh, does anybody see a potential problem? Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, ah, yes. Sorry. Okay. Okay, but not this. Uh, Yes. This was actually bugging me for a while, and the paper I wrote was very conservative in stating things. Um, and I'm stating more here, which I thought was wrong up until uh, very recently. I don't know if people see it. So I've told you there is a local adjunction here, right? And I've also told you that there was an adjunction here. But now you might say, well, Bruno, okay, I didn't even tell you what these functors were yet, so, but things should be a bit suspicious here because if I have an adjunction here, or maybe a two adjunction, I should have a local uh, home set, uh, sorry, isomorphism of home sets, like I've said before. But now I have an adjunction between home categories. So either I have an adjunction here, um, and then something very complicated that's not an adjunction here, or, or this is wrong. Do you see what I mean? Well, you know the answer, right? <laughs> so, an adjunction has many interpretations, right? In the two category cat, an adjunction has a co-unit unit representation and it has a representation in terms of home sets of, of categories, right? But now I've told you there is a adjunction there and an adjunction here, which is local. So what turns out is, and this was bothering me for a while, uh, turns out what happens is the following. Uh, both are true, except this is an adjunction in the two category of two cats, lax functors, and icons. It's a very fancy name, uh, which means so yeah, this is a rabbit hole, by the way, that I've fallen into. So I've defined this, uh, by the way, icon means uh, identity components oplax natural transformation. Uh, it's, it's a funny thing that was defined, but it sort of shows us interesting things happening. So the functor from lenses to, to two optics, which, uh, sorry, this means to be like a iota or like inclusion, that's what I mean to write. Uh, <coughs> it's not anymore just a functor, but it's an oplax functor. So what does that mean? Uh, it's going to turn out that, so what does this functor do, by the way? So it's going to be identity on objects because objects are the same, but uh, the following interesting thing is going to arise uh, that Basically, if you start with two lenses, 
if you start with two lenses, G1, put one from, from uh, A prime to B, B prime and G1 put one, G2 put two from B, B prime to C, C prime. So if you think about what functoriality, what would, if this was like a strict functor, it would tell us, well, it doesn't matter whether we first turn these things into optics, uh, so it would be like this, we turn them into optics, this is their optic representation, and then compose them as optics, or we first compose them as lenses and then turn this lens into an optic. Uh, and functoriality would tell us that these are the same, right? Because uh, that's what functors do. But now we actually, it, it's pretty interesting that we have this lack structure which is weak, which detects this different composition rule. So, um, um, I'm not sure if I'll, uh, let me think about thinking whether to go into this, into the details of this or not. Um, right, so maybe I'll just give an intuition. So here we had lenses and here we turn into optics. Uh, so I'm just gonna have written like this. It's just two optics. And then we can, I'm just gonna erase this for now. And we sort of, we can compose them basically by, well, I'm actually gonna draw this arrow. We compose them or uh, we turn this, first compose these lenses and get, well, actually I shouldn't have erased this, get the composite, get one, uh, get two, and the complicated definition of the put maps, and then turn that into, I really shouldn't have deleted this, <laughs> uh, turn that into the big lens, these are going to be different. But what they're going to be, because they're optics, they're going to be connected by a reparameterization. And I think it should be going this way since it is oplex. And now we have really a strict, uh, a two categorical way to see these differences, which, uh, which was very cool when I, when I found this out. <laughs> um, so we have this oplax functor here. We're going to also have a functor that forgets the residual. Uh, this is going to actually be a strict functor because this is really a discrete two category, the locally discrete two category. And uh, what actually turns out, you can you can do the, you can. Uh, what actually turns out is uh, that these two functors give you an adjunction. So first of all, so yeah. While I was actually looking at this, uh, it, it was very problematic because I, I first had this. I, okay, I, was, I had two categories and a lax functor. And I was like, okay, that's an adjunction. And in which two category? And it's a famous problem that you don't have a two category. of two categories, lax functors and lax natural transformations, strict natural transformations, pseudo natural transformations. None of these form a two category. So that was really weird. And then I looked online and then Mike Schulman wrote somewhere on NLAB or NCAFE, oh, but if you have, there's a very kind of restricted kind of natural transformation called ICON uh, that works here. I'm not gonna tell you what it is. It, it takes a while to unpack. Uh, and this actually ends up fitting like a glove here. And this ends up being an adjunction. And I learned something interesting here, which I think was very new to me, that, so when people tell usually what an adjunction is, they say, uh, I never know which order, but it's like uh, F A B, it's isomorphic to A G B, something like this. There is a local home set isomorphism. And, uh, and then they tell you, right, there is functors F and G that they form unit co-unit. But this is an adjunction, th this one holds in the two category cat. If you have an adjunction in somewhere else, this doesn't really need to hold at all. In general, you can't even state this. So somehow the, really, I, really the idea of an adjunction doesn't have much to do with this isomorphism, like the, the true idea that isn't necessarily restricted to cat. Uh, so this could be 
you know, this potentially could be uh, uh, an adjunction in icons could give you a local adjunction as well, which is really strange. And to wrap it up, what, what all of this tells you is one last thing uh, that, um, so this is, this I'm gonna write this as two cat icon. So it's a two category of two categories, lax functors and icons. And now you can write here uh, cat, which is simply categories uh, and functors. And we can write our usual categories, lens and optic. Optic C. And turns out the previously established isomorphism of these categories is actually an image of this adjunction under a particular functor uh, that uses connected, co well, that is the base change along connected components. Uh, <coughs> um, so what this really means is, uh, wh when should I aim to finish? Yeah, okay, I'll be, I'll be not long, yeah. Uh, so yeah. Um, um, this actually... Uh, Can I ask, is, is oh, yeah. two category of optics really a two category or is it actually a five category? Good question. So, uh, yeah. Uh, here, I need to fix, a part it depends on what particular C I fix. And if my C is merely, so let's just start, optics are defined in generally for not just this, but for a monoidal category. Um, and if my monoidal category is not strict, then this is going to be a bi-category. Okay, I mean, I asked because like, I mean, that would explain why you have icons showing up as your two cells, because those are the kind of two cells that they go with bi-categories as opposed to from a certain point of view. Yeah, I suppose I, I didn't really know that. <laughs> yeah. Because you have, well, it depends on the cells, right? If your one cells are like strict two functors, then two cells be strict natural transformations or pseudo, right? Yeah. And then you could have a two category which has not icons, but like pseudo natural transformations. Yeah, I mean, I guess the reason I say that is that, like, if you, like, two categories and bi categories embed in the two category of double categories in a different way. And if you look at the standard notion of <coughs> two cell and the two category of double categories, then for bi categories, you get icons. And for two categories, you get something else. Um, oh, right. You get two natural transformations. Right. So, so, like, I don't know, that's why in my mind, icons go along with Oh, right. Yeah, because this, I think this should embed into double, which maps two category into a vertically discrete double category. Yeah. 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 It sort of really shows us that these icons are sort of a really assumption. <laughs> this, now, it, this was a shadow of this, and this is really a shadow of something double category hiding. So yeah, to finish just the definition of this functor. So something I learned was, first of all, that uh, there is this well-known adjunction between set and cat, where uh, here I have the, uh, so let me just do this. Here I have the discrete functor, which gives, me, for a set, gives me a discrete category. And this is the right adjoint to what? It's right adjoint to the connected components functor, which takes a category and looks at all the, all the, let's say this is our category. It's going to give us a set whose elements are all the, one element is this island of connected components. This is going to be another island. So it's going to give us a set of two elements. And magically, this, these are adjoint. I didn't know that. So what it turns out that, uh, I also didn't also learn this, uh, that Let's say you have a functor from C to set. 
then a co-limit of f can be equally represented as the following thing. Uh, so what you do is you, you take the you take the co-limit, uh, you take the oplax co-limit of f composed with a discrete functor. Uh, I'm gonna write this this curve. And since this is now in cat, this is going to be a category. And now you project out connected components, and you get the call limit. So, so this, this was pretty uh, neat to me. And by, by basically, this is the whole reason why uh, we're using a lax thing, because we had a coend, which, was, um, which, which is basically a sort of a call limit. And the core observation was, yeah, we don't want to identify these things. We want to make them concrete data. So we do this. Uh, and then this functor is defined here. Uh, so sorry, this should be pi zero star. Um, this functor is defined as following. Um, so this is an adjunction. It's a monoidal adjunction, which means you can do base change along it. So you can look at categories enriched in set, which is just cat. You can look at categories enriched in cat uh, categories, which is two categories. Um, and here you're going to have this discrete star, and here you're going to have pi zero star. Um, and uh, what does this functor do? It takes a two category and gives you a category with the same object, but who, which locally contracts all of this stuff. And you can actually show that this works even in the setting of uh, categories with icons. And this is what defines this functor. Um, so yeah, I think I'm nearing towards the end, really. Uh, yeah, so there is there's a few ways to look at this. Uh, first of all, it's like a cute little trick that allows you to talk about some operational aspects. Of, of how these things work. Uh, first of all, now we see concrete differences in how these things are implemented with two category theory. And the theory automatically ends up fixing itself. Uh, um, but yeah, I, I sort of hope to talk more about the philosophical aspect, and it's not in my brain right now. Uh, but maybe this is something to talk about later uh, at some point after the talk. So yeah, I think this is where, I'll, where I will just end. Isn't that weakly enriched? Is, is that? I think I don't so. Know what weakly enriched is. That's a thing. Okay, great. So this is a local adjunction means really just having it locally on home set and not necessarily natural. Um, when it is natural, um, in the general case, it becomes a lax to adjunction. And an adjunction here is a special case of a lax to adjunction because this is a sub whatever double category of and here you have, this is a, tri this is a tri category, yeah. <laughs> so you have the full. So it's a special K when the unit and the co unit of the lax to adjunction are icons, right? That's what you need. When the unit, yeah. Like it's a, it's a very restricted setting because not only that, the unit and co unit are icons, so this is a, 
but since they're icons, they're identity component. So it means that they have to be inver that yota and pi have to be inverses on objects, which ends up being the case, which is pretty pretty neat. Yeah. So getting back to Brendan's question, does upgrading to this two categorical picture let you clarify the sense in which there's a space time trade off? Is that something that, like do you formalize that? Well, yeah, so as I said, right, what is space, what is time? It merely becomes uh, an explicit cell in our category, right? As opposed to just something that's quotiented away in a set. Yeah. Like for me, this generally, well, there's another whole story of this stuff where, uh, where I'll, uh, you know, you have lenses which are defined for a Cartesian monodal category, but you also have closed lenses which are defined for a monoidal closed category. And since optics are defined for a monoidal category, you have a dual picture here. You're going to have another adjunction here, doing some other stuff. And, and somehow thinking about optics, allows us to unify, like, you know, here we have a Cartesian monodal, here we have closed monodal. They sort of do the same thing. They're all isomorphic down here. Mm -hmm. But here with optics, when we think about their internal state, it, 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 makes it makes it clearer how these things are connected. At least for me, like, I think about lenses and optics much differently now and, and about backdrop, really, once I've sort of unpacked all of this. In an, uh, so can you repeat that? In an arbitrary category? Arbitrary two, two category. category. Okay. Um, there is, seems to be some sort of construction you can do that produces uh, you know, a shadow of that category with a, a nice junction between them. Um, but what are the conditions on that construction? It's some sort of correlimity thing that you can do in some category, maybe, two category, maybe. Well, I wonder whether... So. Let me repeat the question back. I think it, there's lots of moving parts. So you're saying, uh, if I have an arbitrary two category, uh, some, cat, some two category B, whatever, and an adjunction here, you want to do some magic and go into cat and get an isomorphism? No, I'm, just, I'm saying given arbitrary two category C. Um, OK, some C. Under certain conditions, you should be able to take uh, co-limits uniformly across the things and then produce a new two category D that has this, you know, uh, adjunction relationship with it. But what are the conditions of that? Is that hmm. For example, is A here the initial object in these local categories? Because A has a post set and this is initial things. So is that uh, It's so not actually it initial. Have any special place? Well, it looks like it should have, but yeah, but no, but it's no. Yeah, so that's what I. So that's what I thought, but the the problem is like in this home uh, category, you have all these things that are quotiented out. So this is one optic, this is another optic, this is another optic, and maybe A is here, and maybe A is going to be here. Oh, I see. You mean A as an maybe you're right actually. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. there seems to be some structure that's just like two categorical nature, and then they can instantiate it in the object's lens. Well, let's see. The general pi zero induces this adjunction if the category is dealt with as initial or That's the general. 
like, for example, you can repeat the entire story for like, C is now a Cartesian category, and you take prisms, and <laughs> prisms, like, <laughs> prisms, and prisms, even as optics generate the same adjunction as you play, and blah, blah, blah. But every time you have a theorem, like, well, this whole end thing reduces to this nice expression, this is giving you either a terminal or initial object, uh, in the like locally in the two optics, right? Like <coughs> that that induces the junction. Here. Yeah. But not all such a junction is right in this way. You could have something like your carrier two optics is locally so like instead of being just like all possible optics reduced to one point or presented, you can have like different uh, possible non conflict introductions. Yeah, so to add one more thing here, it's that uh, I think my motivation here secretly is to, you know, do this now, lenses embed into poly. So all this picture with, and if I now think about a morphism of polynomial functors, which if I think of it, uh, you know, in sets, so it's going to go from A to B, is going to be our forward, and then we're going to have uh, for each A in A, there's going to be a B prime of A into A prime of, uh, of F A of A. So here we see that we're, there's this issues of, uh, that I would really like to understand in, in, in a deeper way of, of resource usage in, in a dependent setting uh, when it comes to composing this stuff. Because composition of polynomial of, of morphisms of, of dependent lenses is going to do this thing where it uses less memory and more time because it does recompute everything. And I would love to see how to think about this. Uh, I would love to understand this with, uh, in the optic kind of way. And there's a few proposed solutions uh, of how to do this. Um, it's not exactly, uh, I haven't found a satisfying way yet. Uh, yeah. But I'll, this is, this is, yeah, this is it. Why don't we thank Bruno again?